out of the seal to win the Tetrahedron Prize. It was great. It's always uh, it's always terrific to see the community um, think highly of your work and think it deserves recognition of a prize like this. Um, so it's it, it's great and it's uh, great for my students who did all the work. Okay and. It, Nice for me to take credit for all their hard work. <laughs> you know, when, when you win a prize like this, you look up at the ex-winners and you realize you're in pretty good company, so that makes you feel good too. Yeah, my research is pretty broad, okay? Sometimes I'm accused of not being focused enough. Um, but the general theme is we use chemistry and kind of traditional chemical tools and ideas together with biology, uh, molecular biology, cellular biology, to create molecules that you really couldn't make using chemistry or biology alone. Um, so, so one of the examples we've worked on since I started my career is the idea of asking whether chemists can rewrite the genetic code. So every form of life, for as long as we know, uses the same 20 basic building blocks, the 20 amino acids. And the question is how can you form a living organism with just 20 building blocks? And if, and if life is discovered on another planet, will it have 20? Or will it have 21 or 22 or 25? And if it has 21, 22 or 25, will it have an evolutionary advantage to what, you know, is found on Earth? So uh, re-asking that question in a different way, if God had worked on the seventh day, and kept going, what would we look like, okay? So, so we asked whether as chemists, you know, we could use chemistry and biology together to overcome, you know, a billion year constraint uh, on life on this planet. And so we figured out using a lot of, of kind of in vitro um, in a test to rational design methods and also evolution methods that you can carry out in the lab. We figured out how to kind of reprogram the natural uh, protein synthesis machinery to take more than 20 building blocks, okay? And, and so out of that um, has come the ability to really begin to alter proteins in a way that you can't do using mother nature, okay? And you can do using chemistry at the batch. And so we've made protein, we, we've used an expanded genetic code to put probes in the proteins to understand how they work both outside and inside the cell, to understand their properties, their structure, and their function. But we've also used more than 20 amino acids to build proteins that do new things that you can't do with 20 amino acids, okay? Uh, as catalysts, okay, as reporters, and even as drugs, okay, so we've made new classes of drugs with an expanded genetic code. We've even given E. coli uh, 21 amino acids instead of 20, and we put E. coli under evolutionary pressure, and it turns out when E. coli was challenged with a new problem, almost every time we looked at the solution, little bacteria made, they use 21 instead of 20, which suggests that 21 could even be better than 20. So that was kind of where we started and that's still ongoing. I think labs all over the world now have added over 200 amino acids to the code and they've carried out this chemistry on an industrial scale, making a ton of protein. And then the other thing we do a lot of in the lab is we do what's called chemical biology, okay? Where you're using chemistry to, you're creating molecules through chemical synthesis that alter organisms in an interesting way. And where we started in that was trying to find molecules that would alter cell fate. So we all have stem cells. 
and they're embryonic stem cells which differentiate into every cell type in your body and there are adult stem cells that differentiate into cells in your brain or cells in your blood system or likewise okay um, so we asked whether we could find molecules that would affect the fate of a stem cell and turn it into a specific cell type. So we've been pretty successful there, okay? We found molecules that will take what's called a mesenchymal stem cell, which form various cell types in your body, and turn it selectively into a cell that makes cartilage. So you go from a mesenchymal stem cell, which we all have, to what's called an uh, a, a chondrocyte, which makes cartilage. So we've actually taken that molecule and put it into the knee where you have MSCs, and it actually converts those MSCs to chondrocytes and makes new cartilage. So as a therapy for osteoarthritis, where what you do is you lose your cartilage and you have bone on bone and extreme pain and you get a joint replacement, the idea now we're exploring with these molecules, which are in human trials, is that you inject a little bit of this molecule into your knee, you'll make new cartilage and repair the damage. You know, for many years, chemists worked on understanding chemistry, okay? Um, you know. What's the structure of molecules, okay? What's the bonding? You know, how do molecules interacting, systems of molecules interact? What controls their properties, okay? And in synthetic chemistry, how can we manipulate molecules at basically the atomic level? A lot of those lessons have been learned, okay? And I think that now the exciting opportunity is, you know, Biology is just an amalgamation of large interacting systems of complex molecules, but it's chemistry. And do we know enough about how molecules interact and how to change their structures and properties that we can apply it to biology? And I think we do, okay? Same thing in material science. Material science is, you know, complex structures involving interacting atoms and molecules and do we understand enough about those properties that we can rationally design materials okay so I think given what we know about chemistry chemistry allows us to manipulate understand and manipulate large complex molecules and living organisms and the same thing and complex materials so all of a sudden, chemistry has become a very central aspect of material science, okay, um, and solid-state materials, solid-state physics, as well as, you know, biology, okay, molecular and cellular biology. So, so it's a great time um, for chemists. I think the challenge is, is understanding enough biology or material science and solid state physics to ask very thoughtful questions that can be answered by chemists that really tackle a fundamental problem in another field. Okay. You can make up a problem in biology or material science and solve it, but that's not so interesting. It's going into those fields, understanding fundamental opportunities and problems in those fields and then using chemistry to solve it. That is a real challenge uh, to graduate students and postdocs, okay? Because when I was a graduate student or a postdoc, the problem was there. Somebody defined the problem. The only thing you had to do was be smart enough to figure out the answer. Nowadays, the challenge in science for younger people is not only to figure out how to solve the problem, but figure out what problem to solve. Okay, and that's a lot harder. I'm glad I'm not a starting assistant professor because that's a lot harder. And I think part of the challenge in our training is we train students how to solve problems. We don't necessarily do a great job training them to ask what problems to solve. Okay, so that's, I think, uh, as we move forward and chemistry becomes more interdisciplinary, that's a challenge for us as chemists on how to train our students. I use
uses modern information is it becomes unbelievably easy to do searches of the literature. So if you have an idea, you can see, you can learn about A, and you can learn about B, and then you can quickly figure out whether there's overlap between A and B, and whether anybody's done it. So the ability to go in and gather that information in an hour or two has fundamentally impacted our ability to come up with new projects, new ideas, and so forth. Um, but, you know, it's, I think we do use a lot of the, the genomics and proteomics informatics, uh, uh, but that's not our focus. research advisor and mentor. Um, you shouldn't have graduate students and postdocs if you don't think they're all working on exciting projects. <laughs> okay, so I'm excited about everything we're doing and if I'm not, I shouldn't be wasting four years of somebody's life working on something I don't care about. I think it's exciting, okay. Like I said, we're doing some really neat synthetic biology, okay? Can we make a mitochondria? Can we make kind of a, an intermediate organism, okay? Um, can we repair heart as I get older? I find things like repairing heart, my knees that hurt, and <laughs> my brain really exciting, okay? So, so I, I, you know, I, I think in, in, a lot of people think that we work on too many things, okay? Uh, and we should focus more on one area, but I think I, what, what I like about science is you can always do something new and interesting, and if you have a great idea, you can just go do it, and if you can recruit great students, you can probably get it to work. So I think kind of the fun thing about being an academician is you can work on anything you like that excites you, and you can recruit great people to do it, uh, and why not exploit that opportunity? So. becoming more and more driven uh, as you get older by the idea that, that given the opportunity I've had to do almost anything I want in science, and we've done some pretty esoteric things like expanding the genetic code, as you get older and you have the experience and, and insights, it's more and more important for me to ask whether we can make new medicines that impact patients, okay? So we're really focused to, to a substantial degree on looking at problems in medicine, either neglected diseases, people dying of infectious diseases, cancer, okay, or aging and regeneration. And can we have a new insight that really has a direct impact on patients? And so, Going now from discoveries, using what we know to make new drugs that we actually can put into people in an academic institution and show they have an impact is an area that I'm uh, really becoming more and more focused on.